and talent and everything in between. So what we're here to talk about today is the CDAO agenda survey results for 2024. Um, the theme is reinvent or become irrelevant. Harsh, I know, but we will get into the data and back up that point with the results. It's important to note as we get into this that we're still a relatively new function as data analytics, I mean, relatively speaking, um, you know, several years uh, old for some folks, maybe brand new to others. And so we're still pathfinders, we're still trailblazers as we are moving forward through this data analytics landscape as new technologies and capabilities such as Gen AI, AI, machine learning, and so on and so forth continue to evolve the landscape and disrupt industries. We asked CDAOs how long they had been in seat, and uh, we also asked them how many had come before them. And you can see here, 54% are still the first of their kind in their organizations. So we are still really, really new in the grand scheme of things, and uh, being the first, you have to figure out how to proceed. Heck, people across your, uh, the aisle in the C-suite don't even know how to interact with you, <laughs> what you do. Some people, times people think uh, data analytics leaders are IT, and we all know how much everyone here hates that, um, being uh, just, uh, just IT. Um, and so what we need to do is figure out how we're gonna navigate as we continue forward. So let's take a step back to 2023 and talk a little bit about what we found last year and how it dovetails into this year. Now I have to say my colleague Alan Duncan was prescient. Um, he said that the scope of DNA was complex and that there was no cherry picking. And his recommendation was to phase your efforts and build coalitions of the willing so that knowing that there would be conflicting priorities. And so you have to effectively be prepared to spread yourself thin and see yourself trying to figure out how to navigate this increasing, increasing scope of complexity. Now, I will admit, I know it makes me look bad, but I was skeptical. I said, that's not what it says. There were seven items that 50% of CDAOs or more said were primary to the role, seven, and then there were six that were 20 to 50%. So I call those like secondary priorities. So I was pretty sure of myself and said, hey, Alan, we should probably say that instead that there's a pretty clear scope of what CDAs are supposed to be doing. Fast forward to 2024, and boy, did I eat my words pretty quickly. 18 items are now in scope for 50% or more of CDAOs. So that's almost three times the scope in one year, one year. <laughs> I still don't believe this, but Alan saw it coming, so credit to him. Uh, appreciate him uh, uh, standing, you know, hold, uh, sticking to his guns, as they say. Uh, but 18 items were 50% or more. The median number of items for a chief data analytics officer was 13. So we have a huge scope compared to what we had just last year, let alone two, three, four, five years ago. Almost every scope item is up. So it's not like, oh, you're doing this now, you don't have to do that anymore. Nope, almost every item has increased in uh, prevalence. And there's a way to look at that. You can either see it as an opportunity to justify your budget or uh, make the case for greater resources or try to uh, push into a broader scope or mandate, maybe get greater hook in data analytics governance. These are all capabilities, of course, that you want and need, and this is your opportunity to do that. Um, it's just as much as uh, the fact that you could possibly get overwhelmed. But if you think this is bad, I'm quite sure if uh, Alan was as prescient as he was before, he's probably just as prescient now. And his statement is, you ain't seen nothing yet, it's probably going to continue. Now, you could argue it's an opportunity. I mean, if we're talking a CDAO, a C-suite executive, um, should have said scope and responsibility. Um, but I've been saying for years, oh, I gotta start with a narrow scope, show quick wins, build momentum for the program. And of course, I've stuck to that, and it's a great way to get started, but I think the time has come for the broadening and the, and the increasing altitude of the role. Exposure and influence are actually gonna be relegated into technology functions. So if they say, hey, are you IT? Instead of scoffing and getting offended, you might actually have to reluctantly say, well, yeah, I guess I kinda am. So we don't want that to happen. So I uh, wanna be clear, <laughs> we're predicting that people who don't do this will go there. So let's talk about how you cannot do that so you won't go there. 
There are three trends that we saw in the data we'd like to talk about today. First is data analytics governance gets real. Second, evolve or mature quickly to keep up with the expanding scope of responsibilities. And then finally, chief data analytics officer, justify yourself, show and prove value. Let's start with the first one, data analytics governance gets real. So let's talk about the, the positives first. First thing is that data analytics governance has matured from the data. This is great news. We're getting better, we're maturing. This is both, notice it says DNA governance, that includes both like the prioritization of good projects, working on things that are gonna have business impact. Also includes, of course, data governance, making sure you're improving data so you can use it to actually get that value. Secondly, it's good to know that 89% say that DNA governance is essential to innovation. Um, for folks who do have a tech background, you'll get this analogy. Um, if anyone remembers years ago when folks were adopting Agile, everyone was using Agile as a euphemism for cowboy coding or do whatever you want. And the messaging that we gave in the research advisory space was it doesn't mean that. Agile requires as much, if not more, discipline and process than waterfall. <laughs> that message applies here. So we do know we want to innovate, we want to try new things, we want to experiment, we want to transform our industries. But you, of course, need good, strong, as, uh, as much as, or if not more, governance than you had before. However, unfortunately, value, consistency, and flexibility are lacking. So when I say that, I mean the delivering value, uh, consistency, and execution. Uh, flexibility we're talking about, which I'll show you in a second, uh, budgetary, financial, resource, flexibility. Not as much as we would like. Definitely want to shore that up, and I'll mention that again in a second. Again, back to good, 82% um, are uh, identifying uh, can identify required data, and 73% can access required data, which is great. However, we're missing the capabilities that we need to support innovation and AI use cases. So definitely want to improve that. So no matter where we are in the process, whether we have, uh, we're not doing analytics yet, we're doing BI, we're doing dashboards, we're doing scorecards, we're doing reports, whether we're doing analytics, but we're not doing AI yet, or whether we're doing AI, but we're not truly feeling like we're driving transformative change, uh, we need effective data analytics governance to help enable the organization to move forward, to help drive better data-driven decision-making. So let's talk a little bit more about that budgetary component, because I think this is a big inhibitor that we want to uh, you know, bring to light right now so we can all be able to talk about it in our organizations. The first piece is that two out of five do not have flexible budgeting to support innovation. So um, that is the fa uh, a big issue if you're trying to identify new opportunities. You know, I heard it uh, worded by a data analytics um, or an analytics uh, manager said, you know, I'm able to identify a cool new opportunity, but then whenever I go to do it, everyone else slows us down on the back end. Maybe we don't, the data's not good enough, and the data team's like, well, we'll get back to you in six months. It's like, well, wait a second, I need it now. I could identify this cool new innovation. The business is excited about it. And then, you know, three, six months later, you go, ta-da, here's the data, it's ready to go. And the business is like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I remember I was talking about something three months ago. I thought you ignored it because we hadn't seen anything. Secondly, we have an allocated budgeting model. So this uh, problem, manifest in the sense that if you identify the projects that you're gonna work on at the beginning of the year and that's how you're al allocating funding for the year, you're not able to adapt or respond. So if something new comes up or there's some sort of new opportunity or JNAI starts taking the world by storm or whatever the case may be, uh, you're not able to respond to that and say, hey, maybe we should be doing something here. Now don't get me wrong, I guess that's probably a bad example because I'm sure everybody and their brother was <laughs> saying, hey, what are we doing about JNAI? This is you know, showing up in the news. And, can we do something with it? And of course, that'll come up. And then when you get leadership involved, oh, now let's get the budget, or now let's change direction. But obviously, it would be nicer if we had a little bit more control and didn't have to have the entire world change uh, for us uh, to actually get the um, attention that we needed to, to get the budget or uh, funding reallocation. Uh, only 23% have PL. Now, I know that's a uh, uh, you know, it can seem like, well, you know, we're trying to enable, we're trying to start the foundations, but if you're really trying to deliver value, having some sort of accountability and some sort of ownership over that value delivery and what kind of impact you're actually having on the final outcomes is, of course, very useful. And as I mentioned, I foreshadowed a moment ago, budget constraints are now the number one inhibitor to our effectiveness and ability to deliver. 
So it's pretty clear based on this data that we need to rethink the way that data analytics is funded. So it's a very important conversation that we should be having with leaders, with executives, about how we move forward with our programs. Again, more scary data for you. <laughs> we predict that 40% of CDAOs will have rebranded governance as, as enablement. Um, and so the interesting thing here is we're already seeing this, but you know, I, I, ha I have no other way to put it, but it seems like a euphemism. I, 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 I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but the idea is that, um, oh, my, my leadership or my team or my culture, I'm a small team, we're allergic to the word governance. If I even say the word governance, they'll make me disappear and <laughs> never be seen again. So how do I do that? So well, we're calling it data enablement now. And so what's the difference? Oh, it's the same thing. We're just calling it enablement so people won't you know, freak out whenever I say it. So um, we're at that point now for some folks, but I, I, we do see the 40% um, is gonna be something by 2027 where, and, and whether it's a euphemism and people are just saying it or if we're truly talking about it, and what's the difference between just saying it and doing it? I'd argue that the difference is enablement would be when you identify data pain points, you're able to trace that data pain point back up to a business outcome or a goal or something, some measure of success to so say, if we fix this data, we will use it in these three or four ways and here's how we'll improve our data-driven decision making. If you can't tell that story, you are, not, you are just making up enablement as a euphemism. If you are able to tell that story, you truly are enabling. Second, evolve and quickly. I think you all know why we added the quickly here, because when you move from seven items in scope to 18 in one year, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of change. So let's talk a little bit about that particular change. So uh, a big thing here, why do we need to evolve? Well, only 24% of us are overhauling our DNA metrics to be business oriented. Uh, now I know there's an issue here with regards to, hey, I wanna prove my value, and you know, if I, if I say, hey, but this final outcome happened, they're gonna say, oh, you're taking credit for that group, and they did all this great work. Um, I have to say, you, gotta, you kinda gotta put that to the side. You have to own that and say, hey, their success is our success, it is our success, and so lean into that, and if someone questions it, go, hey, you know, ask them yourself. Look at the scorecard, what you can measure, you can manage. That we were able to measure it, we were able to identify their KPIs, we were able to deliver those KPIs, they improved those KPIs. No, we didn't do the work to get the KPI better, but without that KPI, they wouldn't have known what to do and therefore get better. So definitely wanna do that. Second, overhauling the approach to data storytelling. Obviously, we wanna be able to show data and then be able to tell a story that's going to bring it to life. I always say there are two ways to show value. There's the I can prove it approach, which is what we all love because we're all in this space, but then there's the I know it when I see it approach, or my, I like to reword that as you can't unsee it approach, where if you show something that's so compelling that I can't possibly go back to the way I was doing things before. Like imagine you know, playing with an iPhone for the first time and then trying to go back to your flip phone. It's like, no, 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 this is, this is cool, I like, I like this. Um, you want that same feeling when you, hey, I, I'm using this now, uh, I'm able to weave this cool story, I can see exactly what the value is, I don't wanna go back to the way things were before. Um, I, I have to invest in this project because I want the way that you're showing me that this data is suggesting we should, what direction we should take or decision we should make. Third, and this, this was the scariest one, it's actually very surprising to me, because when I talk to folks, maybe I, there's bias here, because I'm only talking about managing the functions, so no one talk, I don't talk about technology, I know it's a weird thing for a Gartner uh, expert to say, but I focus more on the management of the function, and uh, strategy, and governance, and so I'm more talking about people and process than technology. But apparently most changes, according to the CDAOs themselves, are technology-centric, platforms, data analytics, technologies. So uh, that's, possibly a bad indicator because only a small minority are overhauling resources, methods, and practices. So if we're trying to evolve to where we need to be tomorrow, and all we're doing is technology, well, everyone knows the old adage, a fool with the tool is still a fool. If we're not making changes to the underlying capabilities to actually be better, to be ready for, in this case, uh, Gen AI, these other capabilities, um, are we really going to be fit for future purpose? Well, maybe technologically, apparently we're making those investments, but are we actually going to be able to leverage it and get value and truly have the next 
generation of data analytics insights and use cases available to us? And the answer is, well, it might land with a thud if all we're doing is what I jokingly call the ta-da methodology. Ta-da, here's the tool. And it's like, OK, but we don't know anything about it. We're, we're not doing these things at all. We need to completely change your entire culture. Um, you're going to run into huge resistance before you actually get to see value. So let's talk about Gen AI specifically, because I know it's the, the buzzword going on these days. It's all in the news. Uh, are we ready for it? Well, 53% have committed to it. So uh, you can look at that if you're a glass half full or half empty kind of person as a positive, hey, yeah, we're actually doing it. Or you can look at it, well, half of people aren't. Um, so we're you know, getting there. Uh, only 41% are uh, committed to deploying a data analytics innovation center. That's a proxy in this case for are we really going to start pushing or trying to transform? I mentioned the flexible budgeting. Uh, if you don't have flexible budgeting and you don't have this innovation center, then how the heck are you going to innovate? It's like, again, politics. Can I get the most senior person to say, hey, we need to do this, and then that way we'll get it, we'll get it funded and done? Um, that's not a sustainable way to move forward. And so that's a, a, a worrisome indicator of whether you're going to be able to uh, deliver on some of these innovations. 40% have no interest in data monetization. This is a hard one because you could argue, well, what if the people who took the survey were maybe in like gov or nonprofit or something, and so maybe that's not what their focus is. Well, you know, I have to actually hit that one head on because uh, one of our biggest profiles of the past few years was actually from the city of Turku. And they actually did monetize their data. They identified all these opportunities for how they could use the data that they had about their city to be able to sell to you know, uh, people who are looking to you know, uh, determine where to set up their headquarters in that city, uh, people who are transported within that city, uh, people who are looking to maybe determine how many uh, citizens and things that might, might be a good talent market for their, for their city. And they actually sold the data. And I remember people freaking out and going, public entity selling their data? What, what do you mean? And I said, no, it's simple. Uh, wouldn't you just love to be able to go back to your taxpayers and say, hey, we're going to charge you less taxes next year because we sold data, and so therefore we don't have to charge you as much? They're going to go, great, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'll take that 2% or 5% back on my taxes. Everyone's going to be happy with that, so why wouldn't you do it? So the idea that 40% are not interested, yet there are all these opportunities to possibly not just get value from data, but truly go to the next level and uh, see value through monetization uh, is a little worrisome there as well. 50% have deployed data products and self-service analytics. So again, half glass full, half glass empty, depending on how you look at it. That's good news, having the data products and, and self-service capabilities. You're empowering. That's a theme we've been saying in our CDO circle this year. I uh, actually I introduced it last year um, by accident. I just got up, we were looking at the data and said, hey, this looks like an empowerment theme. And then you fast forward to this year, it literally actually is the thing that is important to empower your organization to make better data-driven decisions. That includes the data analytics staff or the data savvy individuals, as well as the decision makers, empowering both of those to make better data-driven decisions. And then finally, under a third are committed to data, data marketplaces, composite AI, and hyper automation. So, so those more advanced capabilities, things that you're going to see for the next generation of analytics, still out in the future yet. So are we ready for it? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, that result, uh, results in what you see here. Nearly two thirds of us are not engaging to be AI ready. So again, doom and gloom here a little bit. Uh, let's, let's make it worse. Uh, the 75% here of new analytics content would be con conceptualized for intelligent applications through Gen AI by 2027, which will allow you to connect uh, your uh, insights and actions more effectively. So effectively, I always say, because uh, you try to have to explain these things in simple terms uh, for folks who are new to them. And so what I'm trying to explain that, I always say, uh, you know, if you're doing like machine learning or AI or these kinds of capabilities, uh, there are insights, patterns, and things that uh, a computer could figure out through analyzing millions of data points that a human would never be able to possibly see <laughs> through just looking at it themselves. Um, and so this is the next generation of that, which is really bringing context and additional information to really round out your insights, round out your data, round out your uh, KPIs and the, what the data is directly telling you, what a human could tell to really bring to life. Oh, actually, here are these three other points that are related. And boom, you've got this full, full picture of what's going on that you couldn't do before. And that's why uh, it's going to be so powerful. Final piece, CDAO, justify yourself. And 
the big thing I say here is there, there are two things. The uh, first thing is that I feel like, I w I've been calling it a grace period, and we found this in the result of the CDAO effectiveness. Uh, we saw this huge drop off in performance around year two for CDAOs. And we don't think that they were getting worse. Because there are two things that can happen when you assess performance against expectations, right? Expectations can go up or your performance can go down. And which one do you think that is? Do you think that they just magically got terrible? No. <laughs> so obviously something happened in that second to third year where the expectations went up and so their performance uh, plummeted relative to it. And so I do believe there's a case for uh, what you call a, um, a grace period or a honeymoon period where they're like, hey, look, you're new, set up the program, show us some value, approve these reports, show us that you're, you're uh, doing some good work and we'll keep funding you and hopefully you'll be able to expand that out. That period, I believe, is over for a lot of organizations and so uh, we need to justify ourselves to prove and show value. That great grace period is over. Now, what have you done for me lately? And then, as I mentioned, as a result, the people who are in their second and third year of uh, the, the role in CDAO to see a huge drop off in their performance. Again, I believe it's due to, we were comparing two expectations, so I do believe it was the expectations that went off, went up and not that their performance that went down. The second piece, which is here, is uh, ownership and collaboration. So you see here all these different roles, and we'll just pull them all up here at once. Head of AI, CIO, <laughs> CISO, digital officer, uh, and then the CDAO. You know, who owns AI? Now, I got in this uh, debate with one of my other presentations from yesterday uh, about, like, I had a little box that said uh, analytics, and I had AI and Gen AI and things in there, and my colleagues were like, no, 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 you got to pull it out. Well, now we're calling it, you know, business intelligence and data science and, and AI because we're pulling it out. It's a separate capability now, especially because there are AI use cases that are not DNA related, and then, of course, d data analytics uh, opportunities that are not AI related, so they become kind of separate beasts. Uh, but uh, the solution is not to like fight for territory or try to like do any kind of battles like that. It's for the CDAO to be an opportunity to do a coalition of the willing. So let's bring everyone together. Sure, I'm not gonna you know I'm not gonna tell you what you know if it's CIO or head of AI delivering the new capabilities or implementing the tools. Great. Like let's figure out how data analytics can leverage those and get the most value. But the question is for us is are we up to the task of leading said efforts of being the one who does facilitate that coalition of the willing. Well, the good news is 74% of folks, speaking of expectations, which I just said about three times a second ago, 74% uh, said that the function fulfills expectations that the executive team has uh, and has confidence in them. However, and this is a proxy data, this, this was hard for me to get my head around, only half have a cu culture that encourages critical thinking. Now, why? Well, that seems to come out of left field on the slide, right? So what's that about? Well, if you think about it, if you want data to have impact, it has to inform a better decision or enable a better action. The key word there is better. <laughs> better than what? Better than you would have made otherwise, which means you have to change your mind or change the person, the decision maker's mind. And for them to change their mind, they have to be willing to hear information that they don't believe or don't agree with or think is wrong or never would have thought of and go, oh, well, let's change direction then. And so if you don't encourage critical thinking, then you have a leader in a room that said, this is the way it is. And they say, actually, no, it's not. Here's data that proves you wrong. And they go, well, no, <laughs> what are you doing? You're out of here. Get out of this meeting. Don't listen. To, uh, we're not listening to you. That's going to be a problem. Uh, and then finally, only 49% have outcome-driven performance metrics uh, for the DNA function. It's similar to what I said about the, like, starting to track business metrics, uh, but outcome-driven performance metrics for the data analytics function itself only half. So if we're not holding ourselves to outcomes, how could we lead this new generation of capabilities where uh, outcomes are going to be the thing? Now, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure you've seen in the news in the last couple of weeks, there's some, you know, Canada Air, Google Gemini, Gemini some high profile missteps or stumbling um, around uh, using these capabilities uh, in actual business purposes, um, only to find out that um, whoops, uh, you know, we did, wasn't ready for prime time yet. And so we have to hold ourselves accountable to those or else there are going to be many, many more of those news articles and I don't want you to be one of them. So <laughs> obviously we want to hold ourselves accountable to that to be able to think about, okay, what happens if someone asks this question? What would be the outcome of this? And what, what are they trying to get from these capabilities and how can we make sure that we minimize the number of mistakes that they're going to make? But if half of us don't track the business value of data, that data analytics provides, it's going to be very difficult or challenging for us to, uh, uh, to really take on that role of leading the next generation of capabilities if we're not holding ourselves to the success of the program. 
Uh, last piece, the 56% uh, of leaders are open to offers. You know, I, in this section of uh, justify yourself, this, there are really only two possibilities for what's causing this, right? Pull or push, right? Those are the, I don't know which one it is. I'm not, oh, it's 30% pull and 40% whatever. I'm not here to say that. Um, data doesn't add up to 100. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, um, but I can tell you that they're open to offers. So there, a couple of things might be happening. It could be the talent market where your uh, um, you know, very tough talent market salaries go up and, hey, you know, very competitive, willing to be pulled away. And that's possible, no doubt. But it can also be a push. Like maybe I don't feel like I have the authority I need. I don't feel like I have the autonomy I need. I don't feel like data analytics is truly seen as an enabler. It's just some, you know, currently it reports up. I just had someone come to me literally yesterday and say, they just have me reporting to the head of EA. I don't know what to do with that. I'm a data product manager. What do I do? <laughs> it's like, well, that's, that's, a that's a tough one. Um, so that's the kind of situation that can lead people to kind of, you know, Kind of, I, I don't know if I'm going to have a long time here if I can't do what I need to do. But it works both ways. If you're not delivering the value, if you're not showing the value, if the honeymoon period's over and you're still not delivering that value, it could be open offers for other reasons, which I won't speculate. But then the right-hand side, you see, uh, are you more likely to stay if uh, you are reporting a CEO, CTO, head of digital business, or like a CIO or other roles? And it turns out you're much uh, more likely to stay if you're reporting to these roles. And notice the theme across these. Data is a strategic asset. How can we innovate uh, with data? How do we transform digitally our, our operations? Those are the kinds of themes or what you might call incentives or priorities that these groups would have. And that reporting structure obviously only matters for those things, priorities, uh, prioritization and priorities and um, incentives. So um, it could be that those are very important for the success of the data analytics program. So in essence, you must seek to be business oriented and market facing or you're going to run into that challenge of either being relegated to technology or maybe not having the impact that you truly want to have. So by 2026, uh, CEO's ability to deliver data, AI literacy, culture change, so that leadership role, that, that uh, you know, taking on the role that it needs to have of helping drive data-driven decision making, it'll be a top three determining factor in supporting the organization strategy. So we have to step up, it's time to step up, it's time to evolve, it's time to um, you know, uh, rethink our governance and it's time to prove and show our value so that we can have the greatest success possible. Final piece, we've got a few items here. These are kind of summaries and um, the uh, first one there, building relationships. So obviously if you're gonna expand your scope, you're gonna expand your reach. So make sure you're building those relationships with the different areas. So if you weren't involved too much in, let's say, uh, data security, privacy, and ethics, more focus on the ethics, of course, uh, but if you're more involved in that, you weren't before, well, now you got to go make relationships with the CISO and some other roles there, uh, legal privacy and risk and those sorts of things. So just make sure you are building the relationships as your scope expands. Uh, navigate complexity by showing value. Uh, make sure you're always proving value. Trying to find the, the critical business outcome that you're trying to deliver and make sure you deliver upon it. And then finally there, you can see you use AI as a direct line of sight to something that DNA governance can hitch its wagon to. So make sure that you use things like AI and so forth as an opportunity to rethink governance. Is hey, we can do these, but we can't do this willy-nilly. We've got to think about it strategically, but then we also have to be flexible because new things are going to come out all the time. So if you keep those things in mind as you look at these results, hopefully it'll help you to move forward in 2024 as you're taking on this broad, wide scope of responsibility. Um, just so you know, there's a ton of research um, that's, that we have on this for the CDO trends, uh, what it's like to become uh, a, a new to the role for the CDAO, uh, how to address the data-driven culture, data-driven change management, and so on and so forth. But most importantly, I highly recommend, I highly recommend that you download the uh, slides because in the back is all the data. And we all love data here, right? I mean, uh, hopefully we uh, <laughs> hopefully do, or else you're in the wrong conference. But um, here in the back, we have all of the actual data. And I'll just show you here. Let's just flip back here. So you see all the re respondents, the demographic information. But let's skip down here so you can see. So you can see the responsibilities multiplying. So hey, what are the 18 things? Here they are. Um, if you have questions like, oh, what are some of the um, what are we doing for the governance framework? Uh, what are we, what are the, why is the, how is the budget constraints the number one issue? Um, those are all in the back. So I appreciate one's time today. I hope this is useful. Uh, hopefully you can take this to leverage what your expanding scope is in 2024. And thank you so much for your time today.